Okay. Um, welcome, everyone, to our uh, Fall 2011 Sustainability Seminar Series. My name is Nancy Holm, for those who haven't been here before. I'm the Sponsored Research uh, Program Coordinator here and Organizer of the Seminars. This is the beginning of our fifth year of the series, which we entitled The Path to Curbing Global Warming, Becoming Carbon Neutral. Uh, this fall, we have a focus for several of the seminars on life cycle analysis and other aspects of sustainability and climate change. The entire series is listed on the gold handout up here on the table if you want to take that, or I've emailed that out to those on our email list. Um, I have a sign-up sheet here for the seminars. If you could always sign in when you come, then we can keep track of how many people we get attending. And also, you can leave your email address for me if you want to be on my email list to get updates and hear about the future seminars. You probably get more than you want uh, of emails from me, but at least you'll be reminded always of the seminars. And uh, we usually have two or three a month, and the next one will be next Thursday, uh, next week, entitled Life Cycle Analysis in the Building Envelope. So we hope you might be able to be back to attend that one. Uh, we do videotape our seminars and archive them on our website if you wish to view them there later. It usually takes three or four days for us to post the seminars. So today we're very pleased to have with us uh, for our speaker, Dr. Evan DeLucia, who is the G.W. G. William uh, Aarons Professor of Integrative Biology at the U of I here, and he's also director of the School of Integrative Biology. Dr. DeLucia uh, completed his MFS uh, degree in forest ecology at Yale University and received a PhD in plant ecology and physiology at Duke University in 1986. Uh, Dr. DeLucia is recognized as a university scholar at the University of Illinois, a Bullard Fellow at Harvard University, and a Fulbright Fellow at Landcare Research, and an Erskine uh, Fellow at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. He became a Fellow of the American Association for Advancement of Science in 2005. Uh, he currently serves on several ed editorial boards. Um, his research is focused on the responses of forest and agroecosystems to elevated carbon dioxide and other elements of global change. Using ecological, physiological, and genomic uh, approaches, Dr. Delusia seeks to understand how global change affects the carbon cycle and the trophic dynamics between plants and insects. Recently, his research has expanded to consider the ecological consequences of deploying bio fuel crops on the landscape. Please welcome Dr. Delusia today. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you for sharing lunch with me. Is the microphone going and adequate? Um, 26 years on this campus, and I've discovered a new building. This is my very, <laughs> very first time in this, in this building, and I know you guys really rate because you have free parking out front. That's a very rare thing on this campus, although I... I didn't believe it, so I put myself on the meter just, just in case. I think the tickets are up to 50 or $60, so I don't take any chances anymore. Um, my understanding is that, that your background is uh, mixed, but with some engineers and chemists in the audience. So uh, I will try to keep the ecological, every discipline has its jargon. I'll try to keep ours to a minimum, but if there are things I'm talking about that are jargony and you don't get it, just please stop me during the talk so we, we're all uh, together with it. So uh, I'm an ecologist, and, I wanna, and I've been interested in, in uh, biofuels for the last four years. We started the, I'm a member of the uh, Energy Biosciences Institute, and I'm a principal investigator in charge of the sustainability group in the Energy Biosciences Institute. And so I'm tasked with understanding sustainability issues uh, surrounding the use of uh, second-generation biofuels, biofuels generated from uh, lignocellulosic uh, materials. And so just to get us uh, on, on, uh, on the same page, I want to just spend a minute thinking about, talking about why, why we're going down this road or attempting to go down this road with biofuels. Uh, we have a congressional mandate to do so, and the congressional mandate justified the use of biofuels uh, based on three, three aspects. Um, one, and the one that I'm most interested in, is their capacity or their potential to offset uh, carbon dioxide emissions from the combustion of fossil fuels. So in theory, if you're, 
uh, growing a plant that's taking up carbon dioxide through the process of photosynthesis, using solar energy to do that, storing that carbon in reduced carbon compounds in its plant body, and then you respire um, by combustion that material away, uh, you should be in a carbon neutral uh, a carbon neutral way of extracting energy. So, so a carbon neutral uh, source of, of fuel is uh, one of the main justifications. Of course, there are another two that we don't often think about, but, but the other two inc include uh, bolstering rural economies. So that was in the congressional mandate, and, and then, of course, fostering energy security. I'm going to focus primarily on biofuels from a sustainability perspective and their role uh, in the global carbon cycle. I don't want the, the slide I was about to show you uh, is, is a demonstration that when we're thinking about biofuels from an ecological perspective, we're basically talking about land use and land use change. And the reason I say that, and now you're asking me to remember things that I don't remember, uh, and that's the reason for slides very often is the case, when we think about the energy content of fossil fuels, we're on the order of uh, 50 to 60 megajoules per kilogram. Um, biological materials, lignocellulosic materials, are on the order of 10 megajoules per kilogram. So to meet the federal standards, which is a 30% replacement of liquid fuels by the year 2020, we're going to need a lot of biomass. And so, so when we cast the question from an ecological perspective, the issue is what kind of biomass are we going to get and where are we going to put it and what are the consequences of doing that? And so there have been a number of folks that have been interested in using um, myself included, uh, I'm very enamored with the idea of, of putting prairie, for example, back on the landscape. I mean, we were once the tall grass prairie here. Uh, it is a rich, diverse community. It is a very good self-sustaining community from an ecological perspective in that that biological diversity gives it great resilience and resistance to environmental perturbations. It's very low input. It's got nitrogen fixtures in it, so you don't have to dump a lot of nitrogen on it. I did some calculations, and assuming, assuming a, um, trying to visualize the slide here, <laughs> assuming a yield of about four, four tons per hectare, if we were to try to meet the federal mandates by using prairie as a lignocellulosic feedstock, we would need to plant prairie on in excess of 80% of all the agricultural land in the United States. So while it could meet the needs, um, we would cause other problems by doing that. So one of the targets is to go to some kind of very high yielding system. And, and uh, of course, we're, we're generating about 40% of our liquid fuels now from corn grain. That's the first generation, considered a first generation feedstock. We do tr take the starch and do a traditional uh, ethanol fermentation uh, and use that. Um, corn grain, if we were to go to corn and the entire corn plant, using the rest of it as a lignocellulosic feedstock, we'd be using on the order of 20 to 30 percent of, of agricultural land. And if the promise of some of these very high yielding feedstocks uh, is borne out, like miscanthus, and I think uh, it hasn't been demonstrated yet, but high yields have been reported in excess of 40 tons per, per hectare, and I think we, we need to look at that more carefully to be sure we can reliably get those, those, uh, those values. Um, then we might be talking about on the order of using 10% of, of current feedstocks. So here's the federal mandate. The federal mandate uh, suggests that by 2020 we should be generating about uh, 35 billion gallons of liquid fuel from biological sources, about half of that coming from traditional first-generation feedstocks, corn fermentation, and then the other half, more or less, uh, coming from lig lignocellulosics with uh, some, other, some other contributors uh, also meeting the, meeting the standards. So these are the first generation feedstocks. These are the second generation feedstocks. We're already meeting our, our total for the first generation feedstocks, and we're already behind the federal mandate for the deployment of lignocellulosic. So we're already, already falling behind. Yeah. What percentage does the federal mandate for our It's about 30% of the two, it's about 30% of liquid fuel use by 2020, but 30% of the 2005 liquid fuel use. Is that right? How much do we use right now? That we're currently getting from, lick, from biofuels? I don't know the answer to that. Do you know the answer to that, Hans? From biofuels alone? Well, okay, so, so we're here. 
Um, this is this is about on target. So we're getting about about 12 um, billion gallons from corn ethanol. 35 billion gallons is 30 percent. So we're doing about half of 30 percent or a little less, right? 10 to 15 percent in that in that range. Now you're asking me to do math on my feet. That's really, really bad. Um, and so, so here is just my comment about about the energy about the energy. Uh, I wasn't too far off about the energy content of gas relative to the energy content of biomass and wood products. Um, this is what I was talking about in terms of using the total U.S. cropland. If we were to use mixed prairie in excess of 70 percent, if we go down to high yielding uh, perennials, uh, that might be considerably lower. And so the, so the moral of the story here is from an ecological perspective, the way I see second generation biofuels is as a land use and land use change issue. That's the, that's the context, what I wanted to set, what I wanted to set up uh, for you. <laughs> Unless we can figure out how to, never mind. Um, so we've established an experiment on the southeast corner of campus. It's called the Energy Farm. And in the experiment there, we've planted several different potential biofuel crops, lignocellulosic biofuel crops, and we're comparing them to the traditional row crop agriculture that dominates much of the rain-fed Midwest. The traditional row crop ag agriculture used to be corn and bean in annual rotation. Now with uh, corn ethanol and the markets for corn increasing, although there's a little stuttering in that, it's gone more to a corn, corn, bean rotation. And there are parts of the country now, parts of the Midwest, that are actually growing continuous corn agriculture. And so we've set up large replicated plots. Some are just a little bit shy of a hectare uh, in a blocked experimental design with five replicates. It's asymmetric. Some of the plots, this one replicate is larger plots. And I'll show you uh, why we have this asymmetry in our experimental design in a minute. And this allows us to compare ecological aspects of these different biofuels in side-by-side -side comparisons. This is the first experiment that's been set up at this scale, at this level of replication uh, in the country. And so we're comparing against our traditional row crop agriculture, corn, corn, bean rotation. We're comparing biogeochemical uh, properties of switchgrass, miscanthus, and we've assembled a 28 species prairie assemblage to see how that might perform uh, relative to, to, uh, to the monocultures. The prairie assemblage includes all the major, it's low diversity relative to traditional prairie, which might have in excess of 100 species in it, but it represents all the major types of plants that you would expect to see in prairie. Grasses, forbs, nitrogen fixers, all of those communities, or all, excuse me, all those different, the life history characteristics are represented. And what we're measuring, well, we're measuring lots of different things, but the main objective of our research is to close the biogeochemical cycles for carbon, nitrogen, and water. By closing, what I mean is calculating all the pools and fluxes involved in the cycling of those materials. This, car this cartoon represents an idealized biogeochemical cycle for carbon. From a sustainability perspective, there are certain aspects of these cycles that are really, really important. So let's just go spend a couple of minutes looking at some of the features of the carbon cycle. Carbon comes into ecosystems by the process of photosynthesis. Ecosystem scientists call that gross primary production. That's of that carbon that comes in by photosynthesis, the plants respire uh, back to the atmosphere, some of that carbon dioxide. The difference between what the plants respire and what comes in by photosynthesis is net primary production. That's the harvestable biomass that feeds everybody. And that's also the harvestable biomass. Some fraction of that is available then for fuel production. Some of this material uh, falls off and decomposes and is respired back to the atmosphere by heterotrophic respiration microbial processes in the soil, microbial oxidation. And a little bit, the difference between what comes in and all of the respiratory pools is what's stored in the ecosystem. And in these particular ecosystems, that represents soil organic carbon. That's why our soils are so dark and rich in this area from millennia of soil organic carbon storage as the prairie developed over the last 6,000 years. So that's net ecosystem production. This is as close as we get to sequestration or storing carbon uh, in an ecosystem, although I don't really like that word because all of these things, all of these pools have mean residence times and turnovers. So there really is no sequestration. We're just renting space for periods of time. So the main objective of our research then is to, and you can imagine one of these for carbon and you can imagine one of these with, for nitrogen with different parameters in them, is to calculate all of these pools. The fluxes represent the physiological processes transferring material from one pool to another. 
A very powerful technique we use is called the eddy covariance technique, which essentially gives us a direct measure of the difference between this arrow and that arrow, and it does it 20 times per second. So we get that measurement very precisely over these ecosystems. But we have to use larger plots for that, because that's an atmospheric measurement. That's why we have the asymmetry in our experimental design. And then we make direct measurements of heterotrophic respiration and plant respiration with various types of machines. You harvest material at different times of year to get net primary production. This one is notoriously difficult to measure. We infer this. Maybe after a 10-year experiment, we'll be able to measure it. But we're inferring that right now, changes in soil organic carbon. It's actually quite trivial to measure. The problem is the signal-to-noise ratio is bad. You've got, you've got a, a big pool of carbon. You're adding a little bit to it with a lot of spatial heterogeneity. So it's hard to resolve small differences in short periods of time. Well, let's look at some of these carbon measurements. I measured, mentioned this eddy covariance technique. This is an atmospheric technique. Up here is an open path carbon dioxide sensor and, an, and a sonic anemometer. And so eddy, this is eddy covariance. It's not eddy the guy. It's eddy air tumbling over a landscape. The guys on water resources know a lot about this particular method. So you can imagine as air moves over a surface, there are frictional forces between that air parcel and the surface, and it causes that air, that air to start tumbling, just like bo sort of boiling water. And so imagine a, a parcel of air rolling across this landscape, and it gets to the sensors, and the sensor measures the wind velocity, direction, momentum transfer, and carbon dioxide concentration of the downwelling vector. And then as it continues to tumble across, it measures the same things on the up welling vector. It does it real fast. And so you're getting a net exchange, essentially, of that ecosystem without putting a box around the ecosystem real time. So that's a real sort of uh, um, gold standard measurement for getting uh, ecosystem exchanges. There, the plots have to be big. The typical rule, and this is a gross generalization, is you need about a me 100 meters of fetch distance upwind for every meter you are above the canopy. And our measurements at four hectares, our plot size at four hectares, is the bare minimum. Actually, it's a little below the bare minimum. There are errors in our measurements because our plot sizes aren't big enough. So you can imagine that if you had a really high tower, you could measure net ecosystem exchange of all the processes happening in Champaign County. That's how people do this kind of measurement from aircraft, as a matter of fact, to get regional estimates of, oops, of net ecosystem exchange. And then we have measurements of, of CO2 exchange from the soil. So we're measuring net ecosystem exchange. We can measure ecosystem respiration, which is the sum of plant respiration and heterotrophic respiration. And then by uh, adding net ecosystem respiration to net ecosystem production, we can calculate what gross primary production must be in that system. We also directly measure the accumulation of biomass. And so the accumulation of biomass plus the plant respiration component also equals gross primary production. So we're either measuring these things or we're, we're deducing these things mathematically. But pretty much we've got all of the components of that carbon cycle uh, nailed down. So the things that are interesting from a sustainability perspective is how much is stored in the soil, because that's our carbon sequestration, our removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and how much productivity are you getting, because that's a potential fossil fuel offset down the road. Right? If you can turn this stuff, if you can turn this stuff efficiently and affordably into liquid fuel, which we can't really do yet. So here are some of the data for the carbon fluxes. Let me just orient you on this graph. Um, imagine the blue is a hill coming out toward you. So it's three-dimensional. This is time of year, and this is time of day for the miscanthus soybean system, excuse me, the, um, the corn soybean system, miscanthus, switchgrass, and prairie. And reds mean losses of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, and blue is uptake of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So let's just look at this year. This year, so this is, a, this is our establishment year. It was corn, corn. This year's, a, last year was a soybean year. And you can see that during the winter period, excuse me, the winter and spring, and in the fall period, it's reds and yellows indicating net losses of carbon to the atmosphere. And during the main portion of the growing season, soybean is taking up carbon. And so we see a net uptake, a negative value for net ecosystem exchange. The balance all year long was about 107 grams per meter squared which means if you add it up all year long, that soybean field was a net source of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Compared to uh, miscanthus, a net sink of about 500 grams per meter squared, switchgrass and prairie, all net sinks. And you can see some of why these, these crops work as such nice, strong sinks. Corn does better than, 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 than um, soybean. It's a net sink of about 230 grams carbon per meter squared. 
But you can see why these perennial feedstocks beat traditional row crop agriculture so much. There's two reasons. One, you're not tilling every year, so you're getting lower release to the atmosphere during the off seasons. But look at the extension of the growing season. These are perennial feedstocks. So they're starting very early in the season and going much later. So the total light energy capture during the growing season by these canopies is greatly extended. I will say that I, I'm expecting these numbers to stay more or less the same. I'm expecting the miscanthus number to go up. We had a lot of problems with establishment with miscanthus. So it's not the, it's not the, uh, the savior crop of bio, biofuel production that we think it is. Establishment is a little bit tricky. Um, and so we had to actually replant those sites. So some of the data you're going to see, some of the miscanthus numbers are going to look a little, a little squirrely. This is just the cumulative carbon balance through time. And so this is, again, our, our, our row crop agriculture, miscanthus, switchgrass, and prairie. And you can see that, let's just look at miscanthus. So here's, here's summertime uptake. This is establishment period, summertime uptake, and then wintertime loss, and then summertime uptake. And it's all negative. It's all, that means there's a net transfer of atmospheric carbon from the atmosphere into the soil. This little bump is the loss from the system from harvesting that biomass. It's so small because we didn't have much of a harvest that year. Let's look at the corn system, the corn soybean system. Here's corn establishment. Here's a corn year. Here's our soybean year, summertime uptake, much smaller. Again, slightly negative, but if you, if you factor in the carbon removed during harvests, which would actually be called net biome production when you, when you, when you include human disturbance in the carbon cycle, you're running this system into a net positive. In other words, a net loss of carbon on that piece of landscape compared to these three crops, where even with the harvests, there's a net uptake of carbon. I expect this, num this number will get bigger uh, as those biomass harvests increase, but I don't think, because the, the, the drawdowns are so strong, I don't think they'll become positive. So I think the only one that's going to continue to deplete soil carbon is row crop agriculture. I should say, um, just going back to John Deere, and the invention of the self-scouring plow, when we started tilling the prairie in the mid-1800s, we depleted roughly 50 to 60 percent of soil organic carbon stores in the first 50 to 60 years after tillage. So you're oxidizing that soil, you're jazzing up the microbial community, and you're blowing off quite a bit of carbon to the atmosphere. So these soils are very rich in carbon, but they're at about half the level they were prior to the advent of uh, uh, the row, row crop agriculture with annual tillage. So these are the biomass pools. How much biomass is accumulating? The yellow is the corn, corn, beet, bean rotation, corn year, corn year, bean year. Total above ground biomass is quite low in soybean. The green is miscanthus, trying to establish, establishing. By this year, we should be fully established and should be up at about here. But again, we had, some, we had to infill some of those plots, so they're not quite doing what they should be. I'm expecting this year's data. They'll be running it around on this kind of soil in this, in this environment. About 30, 35 tons per hectare is what I would expect to see in Miscanthus. From a sustainability perspective, I want you to note how much below ground biomass, roots and rhizomes, this crop is producing. It's building not only a ton of above ground biomass, but it's also building a lot of below ground biomass. Some of that material decomposes when it dies and blows off to the atmosphere by heterotrophic respiration. Some of the more recalcitrant carbon, after that material has been worked over by the microbial community, stays and enriches soil organic carbon. So this is, again, further evidence that this, the perennial feedstocks might be actually restoring some of that lost soil organic carbon that we're seeing. Yeah? Uh, I noticed that the units for your middle um, parameter are different than the other two, the roots and... Grams meter squared? Grams meter squared? And then there is something 30-something. Yeah, so it's grams meters in the top 30 centimeters of the soil profile. Yeah, yeah. And, there, and, and so we're missing some because we know that these roots are extending down several meters, but it's a kind of an exponential decline. So we're, yeah. I can't, I can't tell you how many undergraduates it takes to get these data. This is really not. This is taking cores of soil to 30 centimeters, bringing them to a lab, washing them and weighing them. Really <laughs> Really bad work. <laughs> um, both my sons have spent two summers each doing this. Um, I want to spend a minute just talking about soil respiration. We measure total CO2 efflux from the soil and that amount that's coming from the microbial community and the amount that's coming from roots. And let's just look at this soybean year in 2010. This is the total soil respiration. And what you can see is there's a nice annual cycle to it. But what you can also see is there's not a lot of difference between these different plant communities. 
They sent, they all have about the same total magnitude of soil respiration. But let's look down here. This is where it starts getting interesting. This is the heterotrophic respiration, the respiration that's coming from microorganisms in the soil. And we can see that at the top of the bunch is soybean, the row crop. Top of the bunch is corn. If we look at, uh, if we look at the amount of respiration coming from the root systems, they're low. The other crops, the perennial feedstocks, have more of that CO2 coming from roots. Okay? Now, I don't pretend to argue that corn has negative respiration or photosynthesis in its roots. This is done by subtraction, so these er errors magnify themselves. So I think it's fair to say that corn has very low respiration rates relative to the other crops. But the point I want to make here is the row crops, most of the CO2 coming from the soil is from microbes in the soil. Those microbes in the soil are feeding on soil organic carbon. They're continuing to deplete the store of soil organic carbon. Even though respiration rates are about the same for all the crops, the perennial feedstocks, that CO2 is coming from their own root systems. So they're not driving down soil organic carbon by, by uh, accelerating respiration of microbial community in that system. So this is further, I'm building a circumstantial case that respiration, that, that the perennial feedstocks build soil organic carbon and that the row crops are continuing to deplete soil organic carbon. This is a review paper we did a couple of years ago. And we went into the literature and we said, okay, let's find every single paper that measures a change in soil organic carbon where one crop has replaced another crop or one cropping practice has replaced another crop. So this is the change in soil organic carbon over years, 5, 10, 15, 20, 16, 100 years. For corn, where corn is on corn land continuously, but you're removing 25% of the stover, 25% of the material left in the field after the crop has been taken. Or if you're removing 100% of the stover. So what this data set shows is that in, corn, in a corn cropping system, if you start removing stover as a lignocellulosic feedstock, you continue to drive down soil organic carbon. If you were to put sugar cane, if you were to go to Brazil and hack down a rainforest and put sugar cane on that land, you would continue to lose soil organic carbon for 100 years until that grass crop could start building up and, and replacing that lost soil organic carbon. If you put miscanthus, switchgrass, or native prairie on previously annual row cropped agricultural land, you immediately start building soil organic carbon. So again, this is more evidence from the literature that these perennial feedstocks have, abil have the ability to enhance sequestration of soil organic carbon in addition to providing the materials that you might use for a feedstock. Now, I will say this is a little, this is a little bit of an um, error here. It's not an error. It's a little misleading because this is a literature review, which meant it was done with historic publications. Corn yields have gotten so friggin' huge, and the, the harvest index hasn't really changed very much, so these, I don't know what the exact yields were for this, but I'm guessing around 120 bushels per, per acre maybe. Those yields are now in excess in many places of 200, 220 bushels per acre. So there's a lot more material falling to the soil, maybe exceeding the capacity of that soil to take up all that material. As a matter of fact, some farmers are paying to have that material removed. So at high yielding crops, we might not expect this continual loss with, with the stover removal. Okay. Everybody recognizes home. This is our home. I'm always amazed when I fly into Champaign. Sometimes it's beautiful, and sometimes I'm, I think it just mortifies me that this is what we've done to our landscape. There's no argument that this is one of the greatest production landscapes in the world. And so I'm not advocating that we stop doing that. With bean and corn, good thing. Um, production landscape, economies, food, mostly cattle, but um, cattle feed, but, but important production landscape. But there's no arguing that this is an extraordinarily degraded landscape from an ecological perspective. And let's just think about the species diversity. It's two, right? Corn and beans. I mentioned that we've depleted the soil organic stores in this system by 50% since, since we began tilling it. So we've, we've, we've turned this landscape essentially to a net source of carbon to the atmosphere. Forget all the fossil fuels, just soil organic carbon that's being emitted to the atmosphere. We all know that we use very, very large amounts of uh, anhydrous ammonium to fertilize our corn crop. We don't typically fertilize soybean. A lot of that, uh, a lot of that ammonia is nitrified and then denitrified. Significant amounts of that nitrate is lost to groundwater and ends up causing 
is a significant contributor to the, to the dead zone in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, that denitrification process produces N2O nitrous oxide, which is an extraordinarily potent greenhouse gas. So, so um, the symmetry is beautiful. The production is beautiful. The economy is beautiful. The ecology is pretty grim. And so when I got involved in this project, I said, well, OK, maybe this is an opportunity. This is actually my real motivation for getting into this research is maybe there's an opportunity here to diversify this landscape and get more ecological service out of this particular landscape than we're currently getting. Right when I started thinking about this question, about 30% of the corn crop was going to ethanol production. Now it's in excess of 40%. So 40% of the corn you see on that landscape is going to ethanol production. And I asked the question, what, what if we were to replace that 40? When I asked the question and did the math, it was 30%. What if I were to replace the 30% of the corn that's currently going to ethanol production with high-yielding perennial feedstocks? What would that mean for the biogeochemistry of the rain-fed Midwest? And so clearly that's not an experiment you can do, but it's a modeling exercise we can do with a carefully calibrated and parameterized process-based ecosystem model called DASEN. And the beauty of the the beauty of our experiment on the South Farms is we now have a rich data set to actually get the model to work properly. And so we do this collaboratively with a fellow named Bill Parton, who's at the University, who's at um, Fort Collins, at Colorado State University. And so day set includes things like soil type, plant type, weather conditions, uh, mineral nutrition as input parameters, and the output parameters are plant growth, nitrate production, N2O emissions to the atmosphere, CO2 emissions to the atmosphere. And so this is just a demonstration of some of, our, some of our validation data sets. This is our measured growth rates for switchgrass and miscanthus versus the modeled growth rates, um, showing that we're getting the model to work in a fairly reasonable uh, way for growth. I will say that this is a pretty limited validation data set because all of our data for validation is coming from experimental plots in Illinois, but we're running the model for the entire rain-fed Midwest. So remember intro statistics. Never extrapolate beyond your regression line. We're extrapolating beyond our, our regression line. So that's just a, a caveat for this, for this exercise. Um, this particular model is what the EPA uses to assess uh, nitrous oxide emissions to the atmosphere. And here's our uh, measured N2O and modeled N2O productions. And you can see we're getting fairly reasonable uh, agreements. OK, so I want to show you one data set. And this data set is a representation of county by county model estimates for greenhouse gas emissions. So this is, they're in carbon equivalents, but it includes carbon dioxide, methane, another important greenhouse gas, and nitrous oxide emissions, all put on the same warming equivalency as carbon dioxide. So we can have one number represent all of these things. And so this is, for the, this is a simulation for the rain-fed Midwest. And you can see that corn, typical corn production, and this is modeled in rotation with uh, with bean, with whatever the with whatever the county by county practices are, county by county fertilization events, uh, fertilization cycles, all of that stuff. Um, so this is the rain-fed Midwest for corn production, and you can see that it's in the the uh, pinks and salmons, whatever those colors are, and we're getting on the order of 25 to 50 grams carbon equivalents per meter squared per year emitted to the atmosphere. So our current agricultural practice not including fossil fuels used in farm machinery, which is actually pretty small relative to this. So remember that life cycle analysis you were talking about. This isn't the full life cycle. It's just the within the farm gate agricultural practices. So our current agricultural practices, the rain fed, the land in the rain-fed Midwest is a net source of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. If you were to replace the 30% of corn going to corn ethanol, with high yielding perennial feedstock like miscanthus, you switch this entire region from a net source of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere to a net sink of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. And that's before you even consider fossil fuel displacement of having a carbon neutral fuel. So this is model output. It's not reality. But as our science matures, I think we're probably not going to stray very far of this. You get a similar result with switchgrass with mild fertilization. You don't get the same results if you use switchgrass without fertilization. This is really a consequence. This transition from source to the atmosphere to sink from the atmosphere is a consequence of 
two things, three things. I'll just say several things. High yielding, very high yields with accumulation of carbon below ground in root systems. That's one. The absence of annual tillage or the great reduction in annual tillage, reducing those respiratory losses to the atmosphere. And the, all, we don't fertilize miscanthus in our models at all. It's not common agricultural practice to fertilize miscanthus. So we have very low N2O emissions to the atmosphere and virtually no nitrate losses to groundwater. It's just 30 percent. So it's still the 70 percent. 70 percent of grain that's going to other things. So we're only replacing the corn grain that's being used for ethanol now. That's the only thing we did in this model in these model runs. And so this is our nitrate. Let's just look at maize and miscanthus nitrate losses. To this is over a 10-year simulation period. You know we're getting about a 25. Uh, excuse me, about a 30 percent reduction in nitrate losses to groundwater. We've gone from source to the atmosphere to sink from the atmosphere, the greenhouse gases. We're building about, you know, 18, 18% solar organic carbon in that pool over the 10-year simulation period. And we're getting more biomass and more harvestable yield, so the ethanol production of that landscape is actually going up. These numbers actually get even better if you rerun the model and say, okay, I'm not going to use just 30% of the landscape randomly chosen in any county. I'm only going to displace corn that's on the worst corn acres and just grow corn on the best corn acres. You get even more yield um, from an ethanol per per production perspective, and you actually get a little bump in this campus, excuse me, in maize yields when you do that. So this leads me to be guardedly optimistic about at least the sustainability issues from a, bio from a biogeochemical perspective of deploying, of widespread deployment of, of biofuel crops on the landscape. Now, I want to say just a few words about the, about the nitrogen cycle. I mentioned that in our model simulations, we don't fertilize miscanthus. We don't actually have a lot of experience with this. This is miscanthus. It's a sterile hybrid that we imported from uh, miscanthus sinensis, and I forgot what the other partner is. It's a, it's, it grows all over Japan. It's a sterile hybrid, and it's virtually unimproved. And we know relatively little about its agronomy. The longest experiment, because it's being pretty widely used in England, the longest experiment with miscanthus to date is being done at Rothamsted. And at Rothamsted, they've grown this thing for over 14 years without ever fertilizing it and with no reduction in yields. And so uh, either the scientists are being really bad there and missing stuff, or somebody's sneaking out after their pint and fertilizing the field, or miscanthus is getting its nitrogen somehow that we don't know about. Because we're removing biomass. So even though that biomass has a very high carbon to nitrogen ratio, you're still removing a lot of nitrogen from the system. Well, Angela Kent, working with us, uh, discovered that miscanthus harbors nitrogen-fixing endophytes in its rhizomes, stems, and leaves. So everybody knows soybean has those nodules with rhizobium in them and fixes atmospheric nitrogen. Miscanthus doesn't make those nice co-evolved nodules. It has free-living endophytes actually in its body, in the air spaces in its body. And she's isolated a number of these colonies that have the NIF-H gene. This is the gene that codes for the protein complex that does nitrogen fixation. And then she's done something called an acetylene reduction assay, which demonstrates the capacity for nitrogen fixation. And she's found that several of the strains in miscanthus actually have the capacity for nitrogen fixation. A postdoc working with us also looked at ethylene production of these rhizomes. Again, this is a proxy for nitrogen fixation. This is corn. These are dated from last, last summer. Uh, this is corn, this is miscanthus, and this is switchgrass. And she also was able to detect substantially high rates of end fixation in this plant. So we are suspicious that this plant is meeting some significant portion of its nitrogen needs by fixing atmospheric nitrogen. The other thing miscanthus does, as do almost all native perennial grasses, is they are spectacularly good at retranslocating nitrogen from the above ground plant tissues back to the rhizome and storing it there at the end of the season. And so if you let the plant do that retranslocation, it's storing some very large proportion of its nitrogen to support the next year's growth. So I think between these two mechanisms, and we're trying to quantify all this, we don't have the numbers yet, but between these two mechanisms, I think that might explain the sort of miracle of no loss in yield without fertilizer application for switchgrass. This isn't unprecedented 
Sugarcane is known to do this too, also to harbor some of these endophytes, although they, sugar, they fertilize sugarcane very intensely uh, in, in Brazil. Again, thinking about the nitrogen cycle, we put an awful lot of nitrogen fertilizer on the corn crop. I forget what the current numbers are, maybe on the order of 200 kilograms per hectare. I'm thinking. Miscanthus, zero, switchgrass, about 60 kilograms per hectare. It's also put on at a time of year, typically in Illinois, when there's no crop on the ground. It's when farmers can get in the field. It's when they have the time to do it. And so large amounts of that, um, typically anhydrous ammonia, um, ends up in the atmosphere as N2O or in groundwater as NO3. And so we wanted to quantify the NO3 losses. We're measuring the N2O losses. We also wanted to quantify the NO3 losses to groundwater. And so what we did before we set up this experiment, if you work in my lab, you get to use big pieces of equipment. I didn't get to drive this one, but we have other big pieces of equipment. This is laying drainage tile, quantitative drainage tiles under our experimental plots. And these drainage tiles under the four big plots lead back to these little wells that are in the ground. And the wells have auto samplers. So we can measure the amount of water leaving each of these plots. We can sample the water for groundwater chemistry. And we do it, you know, they're grab samples. So you do it, I, don't, I, I think we do it probably every 20 minutes or so year round, those measurements are made. And we measure lots of things in that groundwater, but I'm just going to show you some of the nitrate data. This is one of my absolutely favorite slides in this whole experiment because it's really showing how the succession of an ecosystem, the building of an ecosystem from disturbance influences nitrate losses to groundwater. So this is, this is the establishment year when we put in our crops. This is a corn year, a corn year, and a, um, no, excuse me. This is the establishment year with corn, the second year with corn, the third year had soybean. This is the beginning of this year. We're back to corn again. And this bar represents the nitrate concentration in groundwater for the corn corn bean rotation. And green is miscanthus, purple is, switch, is uh, switchgrass, and the blue is prairie. So after disturbance, we're getting a lot of nitrate losses, even without fertilizer. You're stimulating the microbial activity in the system. We're getting a lot of nitrification in the system. And a lot of that, even without adding any fertilizer, we're getting very high levels of nitrate losses to groundwater. As these two crops start to mature, they're pulling down those nitrate concentrations in groundwater considerably. Corn is still very high. Miscanthus is still very high because we went back and replanted. So we're essentially getting the disturbance event all over again. This is the third year. The prairie and switchgrass are now mature, and we're getting almost no detectable levels of nitrate losses to groundwater, even though with switchgrass we're putting about one-third of the fertilization rate on switchgrass that we do for corn. It's got a perennial root system and the plant's there. So it's taken up that stuff before it's hitting the groundwater supply. Miscanthus has come way down. And this is typical for a soybean year because we don't fertilize soybean. This year, what I think is going to happen is this number will go back up. This number will go back up to the corn level, somewhere up here. And I think we'll see miscanthus drop all the way down to no detectable losses. These are the average flow-weighted annual losses for, uh, for 2010 for, for uh, the cropping system. Miscanthus, that's this year, okay, and the two, uh, the two other perennial feedstocks. So these crops are greatly, greatly cleaning or reducing groundwater pollution that we see from, from our agricultural systems. Similarly, on those eddy flux towers, we have a tunable diode laser that measures nitrous, N2O losses to the atmosphere. And not surprisingly, because we're seeing such lower rates of nitrification and denitrification in those systems with very low fertilizer application rates, we get very low rates of N2O losses uh, for the perennial feedstocks and very significant rates of N2O losses for corn, lower in bean because we're not fertilizing that bean. So essentially, the row crop agriculture is going this, this, and this, sort of indefinitely an alternating cycle as long as we continue doing that, uh, that rotation. OK, so I've talked to you about some of, the, some of the sustainability issues from a biogeochemical perspective, particularly from a carbon uh, and nitrogen perspective. We're very interested in how this land, landscape transition, if we were to go through with it, might affect other things like water and water availability. I can talk a little bit about that if you're interested, but also biodiversity. I mean, I'm particularly excited about this because, I mean, think about it. We're going from a species richness on the landscape of two, corn and bean, to three. That's a huge percentage change. I'm happy with that. <laughs> but more importantly, than even if we were to go to another monoculture, even if we were to go to another monoculture, we are having a perennial feedstock that adds physical structure to the landscape. And so I suspect that's going to be a great improvement for 
a wildlife habitat. We're already seeing it in our measurements from an entomological perspective in terms of the insect insect community. Um, so that's a very interesting thing to think about how this might how this might influence biodiversity of the greater of the greater Midwestern landscapes. Now, something I just want to I'm, I'm coming down the home stretch here. Um, something I just want to I'm giving you kind of a rosy picture from a biogeochemical perspective. There's some serious concerns, and I, I want to raise uh, two serious concerns with you now. And one is this concept of of leakage or indirect land use change. It's a it's an enormously complex issue that's conceptually quite simple. So conceptually, the concept of indirect land use change uh, is illustrated in this flow diagram. If you have an ecosystem A and you convert it to ecosystem B, so if you have corn and you convert it to miscanthus here, the amount of grain you produce goes down. Economic theory would project that if a so if the demand stays high and the amount of supply goes down, prices go up. If, price, if the commodity price goes up, perhaps people in other parts of the world, Brazil, for example, will take ecosystem C, tropical rainforest, chop it down, and plant grain crops going to ecosystem D. The net effect of that on the atmosphere would be devastating from a carbon perspective because the carbon stores in forests are so huge that even if you count the fossil fuel displacements, you have, as I showed you in that review paper, over a 100-year payback time to start restoring the lost carbon that you've, that you've oxidized from the atmosphere. So this is a very real concern, and it's enormously hard to get a grasp of the magnitude and consequences of these changes because we can predict plants and biogeochemistry pretty well, but now we're working through the economic system and human behavior. So now the international economic systems and international human behavior makes it even worse. So this is an economic issue that is a great concern that we have to keep an eye on. My modeling analysis, replacing 30% of corn grain being used for ethanol with miscanthus, should incur no additional land, indirect land use effects because we've already, we've already built in that cost. We're already using the corn grain for producing ethanol, not grain for cattle feed. So if there was going to be a market ripple, that should have happened. So this is one big issue. Uh, the one that really keeps me awake at night is this one. And, uh, and I've yet to see a good analysis of, it, analysis of this. You know, the food versus fuel debate. And so I mean, let's get real. What we grow in the Midwest, what we grow in the Midwest is cattle grain. It's cattle, it's, it's cattle feed, right? 80%, roughly 80% of the grain, the corn that we're producing, that's not going to ethanol. The remainder is going to cattle production. Is that food? Well, that's food. I mean, we eat cattle. But there's a lot of slippage in there. You can imagine how our dietary choices might influence that demand. So that economic link is not a very, is not a very tight one. There are places in the world, there are places in the world where people derive significant amounts of their caloric intake from things like palm oil. And palm oil... Southeast Asia, for example, Malaysia. Palm oil can be squeezed, and that oil can be essentially put directly into a low-combustion diesel engine. It's a direct competition. You take it, squeeze it, use it for fuel. You're taking that off somebody's plate through the commodity pricing system. So where are we now? We're, we're just at about 7 billion, like 6.95 billion projections are in the not-too-distant future, 9 to 10 billion people on this planet. Um, Okay, so if we're not talking about food versus fuel, it's ultimately a land for food versus a land for fuel issue. And I don't know what the math is. And I sure, sure hope that we can sort that one out to think about um, the reality of food versus fuel as we go into this new energy future. I will say that right now, globally, on average, per capita, um, per capita food production is decreasing. Per capita food, excuse me, per cap, the amount of food produced per person is actually going up, not down. So we're in excess food production globally. I'm not smart enough to tell you how you translate that to the crisis that's going on in Somalia right now. I don't get all that stuff. I don't read about that stuff. So we have great production capacity, but this is one that kind of, kind of makes me wonder, gives me pause. Um, so uh, I'm not the one who was digging holes in the field. Um, 
<laughs> Actually, most of the people here weren't the ones digging holes in the field. But uh, this is our research group. Uh, Chris is a postdoc. May Barenbaum has done a lot of the entomological work we haven't talked about. Carl Bernacki, who used to be with the Water Survey, is now with USDA IRS, runs the Eddy Flux system. Mark David is in charge of the nitrate, uh, the, the nitrogen cycle work. Uh, work. Bob Mackey does microbiology. I haven't shown you any of the micro, microbial work in the system. Bill Parton is a dear colleague that helps us do the modeling work. And in the spirit of full disclosure, all of the funding for this project has come from the Energy Biosciences Institute, which is funded by a large grant from BP that has a deep vested interest in testing the waters for uh, the practicality uh, and economic viability of biofuel production. So with that, I'll take a few questions. Mm -hmm. It's late. Please start at me late, so I get a couple of minutes. Yeah. Uh, well, that's sort of a comment question. First one he has to do with wind farms, the amount of land and sort of the cabin and the decommissioning of that, where the contracts that are being written or proposed is that they'll take four feet of the 20 feet Yeah, so I, you're, you're out of my dimension here. I don't know anything about windmills, but I do know with the land, the land, the soil, the soil that they're on. So if these are on, if these are on, um, with the exception of indirect effects, like changing air turbulence and losses of water from the crop, if these are on agricultural fields, I don't see them having a big effect on stores of soil organic carbon. And, and if you were to remove them and plant corn back, I think you'd just be in the same old boat you were initially. If you're to remove them and put perennial, the bottom line with all of this stuff is not from a food production perspective, but from a biogeochemical perspective, perennial, good, annual row crop, bad. Just, just purely bio, from, from a nitrate loss, a leakiness, a carbon perspective. And so if you manage underneath your wind farm with perennial feedstocks, you're going to get some added benefit. Okay, and then my second I have uh, no idea what these standards are you just talked about, but the scoring of the land if it's ecologically based shouldn't stay the same. We've seen a 50% decrease in soil organic carbon with a corresponding decrease in nitrogen stores and soil quality, and these crops are building it up. So it's not, uh, it's not just deep and rich in hill slope and swale, which is what I'm guessing these kinds of scor scorings are, are based on. Um, that, shouldn't be a, that shouldn't be a static. Yeah, no. Please turn off your cell phone. <laughs> Yeah. So um, yeah, perennials, so it just grows back. yeah, I kind of blew. I kind of blew through that. Yes, the perennials just grow back every year. And they're typically harvested. Um, they're tip if you're going to harvest them in a very sustainable way, you wait till after they senesce, so they'd be translocated all that hydrogen. The challenge is, um, and farmers, I went to a meeting a couple of years ago at the Soil Water Conservation Society, and they said somebody said something startling. So I don't know if this is true. But a farmer said there's for corn for corn harvest. There's 14 harvest dates a year. You wonder why they do what they do. And so I don't know whether it's 14 or 10. Whatever my take home from that was, it's not an infinite window for when harvest can happen. And that's determined by when you can get in the field, when the, grain's at the, when the grain is at the right moisture content. So the same thing is going to apply for Miss Campus, when you can get in the field, when it's completely senesced. But once it's completely senesced, you've got all the nitrogen pulled below ground. But the other thing that's happening is your biomass for your landscape is continuing to decrease as material is falling off that plant. So you've got two counteracting sustainability issues. So, you, so basically what you want to do is get out there the minute it's brown, but that doesn't always happen. You get early snow and the moisture content issues get problematic. So 
Harvesting is going to be a challenge. And if you think about, uh, if you think about siting a biorefinery, the first commercial bio, commercial scale biorefinery is being built right now by BP in, in uh, Central Florida. If that's anything like a sugar plantation, an ethanol sugar production facility in Brazil, those facilities in Brazil had a middle-sized one would have on the order of 70 tandem tractor-trailer trucks filled with cane showing up every 24 hours at that site for about eight months out of the year. So that's the kind of mass. It's a low-density fuel. It's the kind of mass we're talking about. So where's the stuff going to be stored? Uh, pro probably what people will want to do is develop on-farm storage relationships that are contractual with the local bio Yeah, Hans. And you were going to tell us about, uh, a little bit about water usage. Yeah, so um, I didn't go into the water cycle. These crops in, on our farm right now are using about the same water as a corn crop. So we get about 1,000 millimeters of precip per year. Corn in these crops are in the 700, in the two years we've made measurements, in the 700, 750 millimeter per year range. I'm expecting the number for the perennial feedstocks to go up. Remember I showed you the carbon exchange numbers and how they lengthen the growing season? They come out really early because you're coming from an underground rhizome, and then they don't senesce till late. So I expect that those numbers will start pushing up to right near precipitation levels. There have been a couple of analyses that show changes in one by Bernanke's lab and a recent one by uh, Kumar Praveen uh, in PNAS that have shown um, that have modeling activities that have suggested that uh, we will see changes in surface water in production availability as we go to more perennial feedstocks. Essentially what we're going to be doing is going back to prairie. We're going to be going back to prairie in terms of having perennials in the landscape. And so surface water supplies could change, which means that not our drinking water supplies, but, but, but river flows. You might see effects on river flows. It's a complicated question because you not only get changes in, in evapotranspiration, utilization of surface water, but you also get a cooling effect. And the cooling effect is not just from the late heat flux of coming off that crop, but you're also, I always get this confused, albedo is surface reflectance, and the crop has a higher albedo than bare soil. So energy reflectance of the surface is higher with the crop, and that causes a, a surface cooling, which feeds back on the way the water runs. So I think the actual, not talking anything about the water used to make ethanol from a lignocellulosic product, I don't know anything about that. I think we're going to expect more demand on surface waters if we grow these crops. And that's why we restricted our analysis to the benefits of these crops to the rain-fed Midwest. And if you get into irrigated landscapes, we're real problem from a sustainability perspective of these crops. Yes. Um, you presented some information that spanned over like 60 years or 100 years, I assume it's based on models. And then with, uh, speaking of models, I, know, I noticed that um, the, um, the data agreement between measured value and the model value was much better for switchgrass versus miscanthus. I was wondering why. Data availability. We have the first, the first, 10 years ago, there was no demonstration plot of miscanthus, scientific demonstration plot of miscanthus in the United States. Switchgrass has been a baby of the, uh, the baby child of the Department of Energy for quite a long time. A lot of people have been working with it. So it's just data availability. Miscanthus has been in the country for a very long time because it's an ornamental. People have been growing it as, as ornamentals. Uh, um, um, so it's been around for a long time. And that raises the issue of invasiveness. People have been very concerned about invasiveness. We have very, remember, it's a sterile hybrid. So it doesn't go to seed. And the rhizomes don't spread the way the stolons of some real noxious other sterile hybrids do. Like, uh, well, um, kudzu's not a sterile hybrid. It just doesn't flower very effectively up north. But it spreads like crazy from rhizomes. This campus doesn't really do that. So I don't see an invasiveness problem. Uh, with sterile hybrids. I'm getting off topic, but I want to just finish that thought by raising one concern. From an agronomic perspective, planting rhizomes is expensive and difficult and part of the reason why we had establishment failures. So the agronomy community would like to go back to seeded varieties. If we go back to seeded varieties, 
that really raises the specter of invasiveness. And we have to think very carefully about how we use these grasses and how to manage that particular problem. So I don't think invasive is a problem now, but if we follow the agronomists, um, it, it might become one. Yeah. So, um, all this depends on So um, I forget the economic numbers, but you can already take biomass and turn it into liquid fuel. That can be done. Um, it's done by uh, thermal and physical processes, and it's fairly expensive. And even at that expense, it's getting close to economically viable if you have high biomass yields and low land costs. And that's why BP is investing in a biofuel refinery in Florida. The southeastern United States is where we're going to get the combination of high yields and low land costs. Um, the Energy Biosciences Institute is investing $500 million thinking that we can get enzymatic conversion, recycled enzymatic conversion done efficiently within the next five years. So in 2016, I should check. You should check. If not, Energy Biosciences Institute will probably close down. I think that's our funding window. And it's been very interesting. This has been my first time working with a large corporation. Uh, I've always been funded by NSF and DOE. Um, this is targeted research aimed at product and, um, and IP development. And so it's, I think if we don't meet that target, I'll be giving a different lecture a few years from now. Thank you.